Hey everybody, this is going to be a mega video about all the different comma rules that you could bump into while writing. And if you have any questions about these rules that I'm going to discuss, you're more than welcome to go to the Purdue OWLS website because they have a page of comma rules, kind of paraphrased a little bit differently if you need to kind of see those visually. But I do have one quick warning that there are a lot of comma rules and I'm concerned that you're going to be a little stressed or overwhelmed with all of them, but a lot of these rules you know already, or we have already reviewed this year, or you've probably already watched one of my grammar videos about, or if not already, you're going to watch future grammar videos that overlap with this one. I have intentionally created this repetition and this overlap because a lot of people need repetition to learn all these comma rules and get these memorized once and for all. So if you need to rewatch this video, great. Or if you want to get more information about a topic, there's probably another video that also addresses it as well. So why do we care about commas? Um, to be honest, a lot of people over or under use them, or they just randomly put a comma anywhere they feel like a pause should go. And that pausing method is flawed because in a lot of those times, a different punctuation mark should maybe go in that pause spot, or perhaps, again, you're just kind of putting them someplace where it really doesn't belong, and it makes you look bad. So, there's actual credibility and professionalism issues if you overuse them, or, professionalism aside, you could completely change the meaning of the sentence with whether or not you put a comma and where. So here are some comma rules you probably already know because they're often taught in younger grades. So you put a comma between a city and a state or a city and the country that it's in. That's easy. You also put commas around a date when all parts of the date are being listed. So month, day, and year get two commas. January 1st, comma, 2016, comma. Okay. I do not need to put a comma with dates if I'm only using two parts out of three. I don't have to put one between November and 2016 since I'm not saying what date in November. I don't have to put commas around this range of February 20th to March 4th because I'm not specifying what year. Now you also use commas when I'm clarifying a title after a name because that's a type of a positive, which we'll talk about more later. I don't need a comma between Senator Brutus, because that's part of his title beforehand. I don't need to put a comma between doctor and so-and-so, but I would need to put a comma, or two commas even, around a title or description that comes after the name, so Sarah Hardin, PhD, is a teacher and an author. Well, I wish, but no. <laughs> um, so in this case, it comes afterwards, I need a comma. Uh, a lot of times when people have the part, so the affix junior in their names, um, they're supposed to have a comma with that as well, but we don't always do that in our culture. So here's where we start stepping into stuff you might or might not know. First of all, there's a thing in grammar called nouns of direct address. These happen usually in dialogue, and this is when I am talking to a specific person or group directly, and I want to get their attention. I might say, Mom, can I please go to the movies? And when I'm talking directly to Mom like this, I'll put a comma here. Coach, let me play. Dude, I don't know what happened. Or Listen up, team. We need to focus. So, nouns of direct address are usually at the very beginning of the sentence, but they can happen in the middle or somewhere else, too. And again, if I have a little interruption like this, or if I'm talking to someone directly and I'm saying their name, put a comma. A positives are kind of like nouns of direct address, and they can actually overlap. For example, my teacher, Mr. Buckeye, is a formal football former football player, excuse me. In here, Mr. Buckeye is the a positive because I am restating or renaming who my teacher is. 
I am clarifying or adding on to or naming that person. And when I'm naming like that, it's called an appositive. And I do put commas with it. And appositives can be in the middle like this or they can be at the end. He gave dog treats to his favorite pet, Sniffles. Who's the favorite pet? Sniffles is. I'm adding it on, so I'm going to put a little comma right here to show that this is an appositive. And interjections are another type of brief pause that get a comma. Interjections are actually one of the nine parts of speech, and they are their own category. And these are abrupt remarks, exclamations, or side comments. And just like a noun of direct address had a little word and then a comma, interjections are also a little word with a comma, except these are just not names. Whoa, that was awesome. Hey, why did you do that? Yeah, I'll do it later, okay? So in this final sentence, both yeah and okay are interjections. They're these single words, or sometimes like a couple words, um, that are exclaiming or making a side comment. This list stuff, you may or may not already know. I'm hoping you do. If I'm listing only two things, I don't need a comma. Whether that's a compound object, like I bought two things, cheese and bread, no comma. Or if maybe I have a compound predicate or a compound subject, Andy and Buzz went on a space adventure. Don't put a comma between Andy and Buzz. You don't need it. You do need a comma if you have three or more things. In fact, the, when you're listing three or more things and you use that comma before and, it's got two names. You can either call it a serial comma or an Oxford comma. Now this is actually controversial, and I've watched grammar nerds argue this really intensely. Some schools of thought and professions and job industries use the Oxford comma and some do not. In the humanities, we often do use it. In certain uh, journalism fields, they don't. So if you pick up a book or an article, you might see the Oxford comma missing, and that was probably on purpose. However, at least in the United States, the ACT and SA still, sorry, still want it, so please use the Oxford comma, at least for now. Once you get into college and get into your job field, it may change. So I went to the store and bought eggs, bacon, comma, and bread. The Jedi, Ewoks, and Rebels fought against the Empire. If I have three different things being listed, use that comma with the word and. Adjectives can get tricky if you have a bunch of adjectives together. For example, if I have two or more adjectives that I want to stay in a certain order, or that I think are of equal importance, then I'm going to call them cumulative adjectives and they do not get commas. The lack of commas shows that I want these words to stay put. The red rusty bicycle. If I flip-flopped these and said the rusty red, suddenly the meaning of the sentence has changed. Right now, with this sentence, the bicycle is the thing that's rusty. If I flip-flopped these, I might create the false impression that the color red is rusty, like it's a shade of red that's rusty, and that's not accurate. And in the second example, my favorite brown leather book bag. Whew. It's a bunch of adjectives together. And if I mix up the order of these three, it could change the meaning of the sentence. So I'm just going to keep everything like it is and put no commas. And that's okay. But if the order of those adjectives is reversible, or I could rearrange them and it would be fine, those are called coordinate adjectives, and they do get commas. The old broken laptop sat on the shelf. The sad, empty piggy bank. Actually, piggy should be highlighted too, sorry. This is also an adjective right now. Um, but sad and empty are the two coordinate ones. I like to imagine that the comma in between is like that center pole of a revolving door. You know, it's a weird metaphor, but it kind of reminds me that these two could be rearranged or spun around and it would be fine.
So transitions and different types of introductions also get commas. If I start a sentence with an introductory phrase or an introductory clause, like maybe a dependent clause, then it gets a comma. In 1969, comma, man landed on the moon. Across the field, the marching band was setting up to play. After the war ended, the soldiers got college educations. Now these first two are just introductory phrases. Because a phrase is either a subject or a predicate, this just has a year. This tells me a preposition, an article, and a noun, so there's no verb, there's no predicate, so these are just phrases. But the clause after the war ended is dependent because after is one of my Wubis words, the war, subject, ended, predicate. So this is dependent, and I'm still getting a comma because it's an introductory something or other. Now if you've watched my semicolons video, you've probably already been introduced to conjunctive adverbs and how to carefully put uh, a conjunctive adverb with a semicolon and therefore you get a comma anytime you're doing a single transition word or a single conjunctive adverb. First, comma, I have to go mow the lawn. Dance is considered a sport too. That's an adverb right there. Cookies are great, semicolon, however, brownies are my second favorite. Different kinds of interruptions in the middle or ends of sentences also get commas. Not just the positives like we described earlier, but modifiers that are non-restrictive. So my neighbor, who's a doctor, or my best friend, who was sick, this Saturday, which is also my birthday, his foul shot percentage, which is decent. So these add-ons, these interruptions that have bonus information, that's not critical to a sentence, get commas. Compound sentences get commas with fanboys conjunctions. We've talked about this in sentence types videos and when we're trying to prevent or fix a run-on, but this is just a reminder that if I'm going to use a comma to join two complete sentences, I must also have a fanboys conjunction and vice versa. Otherwise, I'm creating a run-on, and that's not cool. There are a few times when we should not use commas, where people kind of mess this up a little bit. You don't want to put a comma between a subject and its verb. There's no reason to pause in the sentence, Brutus jumped for joy. It's a simple sentence with no real modifiers, so don't do it. Again, like I said earlier, don't put a comma between two listed items. Green eggs and ham doesn't need a comma. And also, like we said earlier, don't put commas between compound subjects, compound predicates, compound objects. Any kind of two-part list probably doesn't need it. Here's some practice for you, combining all the different rules from this video. Take a quick pause and see if you can confirm if each sentence is correct as it is or if it's incorrect because there's a comma error in it. Here are the answers. Most of the sentences were already correct as is. There were only two comma errors here. The first comma error is number two. Every Sunday, introductory phrase that needs a comma, we volunteer at a soup kitchen. And the other one was number four. I'm sorry, there, I should have put a space there. Darth Vader built the Death Star, comma, and he in destroyed several planets. Here's a comma fanboys joining two sentences together. Now, three and four are not the same sentence, and I did that to you on purpose. Number three shows Darth Vader doing a compound predicate. He's doing two things, or is a list of two things. Built the Death Star, destroyed planets. Number four actually is a separate second clause because I get the subject he. The word he is the only word that's different between three and four, but that changes the rules. So I hope this video was helpful to you, either a good review or taught you new things. And remember, please rewatch this or watch any of the other videos that overlap with this if you need help. Thank you bunches for watching.